Holbrook Travel is pleased to be bringing you this webinar today, Capturing Life Through Photography, an online workshop with Rainier Mungia. Uh, Rainier is going to be sharing some photography tips with you, going through things like camera equipment, using photos to tell stories, uh, topics to explore as a photographer, uh, as well as sharing some ideas for what to do with all those pictures that you're taking. Rainier is the owner of Wild Stock Photography. Uh, he is a commercial and nature photographer with a strong education and conservation vision. His work has appeared in textbooks, magazines, and uh, various other publications, and his passion for nature has spurred him to become an advocate for causes related to the protection of species. Educating people about nature has become his most important goal. Rainier has also taken on the role of Vice President of Education for the Lake, Aud Lake Region Audubon, excuse me, where he conducts multiple presentations, uh, as well as leading conservation and outreach programs. Over the years, he has presented at large nature and photography events, including the Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival, the Big O Birding Festival, and the First Coast Nature and Photo Fest, among others. Uh, wanting to explore more of the natural world, Rainier has led photography and birding trips throughout the United States, as well as to destinations such as Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Puerto Rico. As the president and teacher of the Polk County Camera Club, he educates amateur photographers, not only in the proper use of their equipment, but also in the ability to self-evaluate their work. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome Rainier. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much to Holbrook to uh, put together such a great uh, programs. And the fact that with these times that we're living nowadays that we cannot even go out, uh, this is a, a really good way to uh, get our message across and still keep people entertained with some of this good stuff. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here for a second. So, why is this showing there? there we go. Um, you guys should be able to uh, see everything now, right? Yeah. Everybody's there, good, good, good. Okay, well, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar on capturing life. And um, I'm really glad to be on this side of the screen, uh, talking to you guys uh, about what I do as a photographer and what really inspires me to do the kind of work that I do. So we're gonna we're gonna go little by little over some of the basics. Uh, we got already a bunch of questions from people that already uh, sent their questions ahead of time. So we're gonna be able to answer some of those questions. Uh, a little bit about me. I started as a photographer at the age of 16. My dad uh, gave me a camera, said, you know what, do something with this. Uh, I still have that camera. It was the first autofocus camera, my Minolta. It was a Maxim 7000. Uh, I still have that little baby somewhere that was filmed. Uh, we have, over the years, I've been able to see how uh, this hobby has switched uh, dramatically from going from film-based photography to digital photography as we use nowadays. I was born in Cuba. Um, I left the, the country at the age of eight years old and then went to live in Puerto Rico after coming to the United States where I live about three months. Then I moved to uh, Puerto Rico where I actually went through college, married my wife, and then decided to come back to the U.S. Um, among my hobbies, well, <laughs> uh, what I do for a living, let me go back for a second, hold on. Uh, as a professional, I do a lot of graphic design and do um, a lot of illustrations. I like to illustrate wildlife and nature. So pretty much most of my work has to do with teaching people about our natural resources, wildlife, and all the really cool things that we have learned over the years about uh, different species of animals. So I'm basically considered a naturalist. That is not the same as a naturalist. Uh, even though we like to be in nature, one does it with clothes and the other one does it without. So <laughs> big differences here. Now, in terms of hobbies, I like everything that has to do with the outdoors, hiking, canoeing. I love traveling. I'm also a, a private pilot. I love flying. Uh, cooking is one of my passions. You'll see that later on my photography because I love shooting food. And also I do wildlife rescue, which is uh, uh, really time consuming. And when you don't find me taking pictures or you don't hear from me for a while, it's because I'm so involved working with eagles, hawks, and owls. So anyway, um, the first thing that comes to mind is what kind of gear do you need to have when you're traveling, when you're doing this type of photography that I do? Reality, uh, we have a variety of different tools that we can use. Some of them are really simple and some of them are a little complicated. I can tell you that our photography most of the time is gonna be done with a DSLR, even though I actually carry one of these little cameras. They do awesome, it's a small mirrorless camera. 
that uh, I can take pretty much put in a pocket and just walk around with it. So you also have GoPros and you have, well, the most common camera nowadays is your cell phone. Um, that's something that I actually carry and believe it or not, at first I said, no, I'm not gonna use a cell phone to take pictures. That's not right because I have spent so much money on equipment, I don't wanna buy, uh, I don't wanna be taking pictures with my cell phone, but I'm, I'm gonna be honest to you. When you're traveling sometimes, there's something called convenience and you might not be able to pull that camera, but you'll be able to get that phone and take a shot and, and go out with a really nice image. Um, I also have used drones. I think that changing the perspective and be able to put myself above what everybody else is seeing uh, is also, also really conducive to amazing pictures. Uh, and I'll show you some samples of how that works. Um, now, it depends where you're going, the kind of, uh, the amount of equipment that you can carry. I know that there are limitations, like when we go to the Galapagos, if you fly to, uh, to uh, Africa, a lot of the countries will limit the amount of stuff that you can take on your flights. Uh, so obviously you have to be really careful. Now, what is the best camera to take with you? I'm gonna be honest with you. The best thing you can do is take the camera that you already have, the one that you already know. Um, I hate to tell you, but I have a lot of people that come to my workshops and they fly, say, to Costa Rica or Galapagos, and they come in with a brand new camera that they just got in the mail two days before they, they, they left the country. That is not good because you're gonna be uh, now learning a whole new camera and uh, you know, you're know you gonna put a lot of stress on me as, your, as a person that is doing your training because now I have to also learn your camera. <laughs> so make sure that you bring what you already have and that you know well. Also think about uh, cameras that are light and that are easy to replace, especially when traveling. Uh, you know, if something were to happen, you wanna make sure that, you know, I, I can take the same picture with a $600 camera that I can do with a $2,000 camera. So which one will I take to a high risk situation? I'll probably take the inexpensive camera because if I need to replace it, it's not gonna cost me that much money. Now, what is my favorite photo subject? A lot of people ask me that because they have seen me uh, taking pictures out there in the wild, walking on a preserve or something. And I have to be honest to you, if you see some of my work, you automatically you're gonna say, yes, this guy does just wildlife photography. But that's really far away from the truth because I like a little bit of everything and I like to bring things together by combining not just the wildlife, but also the lifestyle of the people in the area where I'm shooting type of food, the type of uh, uh, construction buildings, uh, everything is part of this uh, process of capturing life. So here's one example, one of my favorite destinations is Galapagos and I've been able to be to Galapagos about eight times now. Um, seven of those have been with Homebrew, which have been a, an excellent company to uh, schedule and program, uh, put together all the logistics of my trips. So this is one of my favorite uh, iguana shots that I've taken in the Galapagos. Obviously the landscapes are amazing, especially at, towards the end of the day. This is one of the things you're gonna learn as a photographer is that you're, you're looking always for the best light. Uh, that means you're gonna be shooting early in the morning, late in the afternoon, when the sun sets, when the sun gets low, that gives you the most definition, the best shapes and sh shadows uh, to work with. Um, obviously, working against the light can be tricky, but that can be done. As you learn, you get better and better. Um, this is a, uh, a magnificent frigate bird in the Galapagos Island. Obviously, um, my subjects are gonna be mostly nature, so I'm gonna focus on getting you the best I can. I need to make these guys are like my models. Uh, I need to make them look gorgeous, um, extremely big, like in the case of this tortoise, uh, what I did is I lowered myself, I got it lower, so I can shoot slightly up, and that gives you a feel that this animal is huge. I mean, it's actually big, but the picture here makes it bigger because of the low angle that I used to shoot that shot. Same thing here, I mean, I'm really close, I'm with a 10 millimeter lens, uh, probably less than, I would say 12, 15 inches away from these guys. I'm laying down with them, and they're just starting to uh, uh, interact with each other, and this is what makes the shot, it gives you that 3D look that you're almost there with these sea lions. I always like simplicity. I like to uh, be able to focus on my subject as much as possible and get all the really nice subtle details in this case of a brown, uh, of a red-footed booby. Uh, yes. I'm sorry to jump in. 
there's a little bit of feedback on your audio and I'm wondering if you might be able to adjust your mic a little bit. There's a sort of a humming or a ringing sound. Well, I don't hear that on my end. Um, <laughs> don't know if I can, what can I do? You know Zoom better than me. Let me to lower, see if I can lower the volume from, sorry, am I sharing this now? <laughs> Um, I can see your screen still. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure what it is exactly, but yeah, maybe just try moving the mic a little closer. It seems like maybe that helped, whatever you just did. Okay, oh. that makes sense. Does it, does it get any better then? It's still there. Um, yeah, if I guess, um, hmm. I guess we can, we can go ahead and continue. I don't wanna interrupt the, the presentation. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. So, so yeah, no problem. So obviously uh, one of the things that I concentrate the most is on getting as much color and as much of this beauty from all this wildlife. Um, so obviously uh, light plays a really big role on how the, the light, um, how, the, uh, how the colors are gonna be shown on the picture. So we're always looking for the best type of light. And in this particular case, you can see the light coming from slightly behind this uh, Kill Bill Cooking. Um, here we go, this is another shot that I like about the whole uh, presentation, the fact that it's in a diagonal, that's something that we work with uh, in composition is try to make sure that our pictures look uh, the best we can. Um, they follow certain rules of composition. Um, every, every single picture has a, a little story to tell. In this particular case, you can see the tadpole behind this poison dart frog. Uh, you have no idea how many years it took me to find this particular photo. Um, I've been looking for this for almost eight years and finally I was able to get this one about three years ago. Um, I also like to show the reality of nature and how uh, wildlife interacts. Obviously, if you see this picture, you, uh, you find a snake that is trying to eat a, a, a frog that is bigger than the, the snake itself. But you can also see how the frog is actually choking the snake on the back behind the head, trying to avoid uh, the swallowing. Um, I love the uh, megafauna in the United States, especially the big animals like uh, the uh, elks and uh, drop horns, all these beautiful wildlife that we have in the Western United States. So I try to capture the best of their life. You know, this is what's going on. This is a male chasing a female. Uh, he had like probably a herd of over 50 uh, females with him. So very interesting. So a picture is worth a thousand words and a few pictures make an essay. With that said, let me show you what I mean. There, there will be chances where you'll see a picture that just by looking at it, you can tell a lot about what's going on. And in this particular case, uh, this happened to me about two years ago, I was going down the Napa River and I started seeing families working on the side of the, uh, on the side of the river. And I figured out that what they were doing, they were digging for gold. Um, by the way, if you go later to my website, I have a section called about the shot you will have more information about each one of these because I don't want to spend too much time here. But what struck me the, the most was seeing that little kid carrying probably over 60 pounds of dirt on his back. Uh, and there were many of these families all scattered down the river. Um, this is a really interesting uh, shot because it shows how human and animals interactions uh, occur at this particular uh, park in, um, in Costa Rica. Unfortunately, it's not a good thing for the monkeys. Many of them are coming out sick because they ingest uh, the wrappers of food that people bring to, the, to this area, or they're even getting uh, diseases that are being transferred from humans to the monkeys. Um, Veneer, I'm sorry to interrupt one more time. I'm wondering if we could try one other thing. Um, sure. Do you have a, a speaker or a, a microphone directly on your computer without using the headset? Could we try? Uh, we can try that, but I'm thinking we're gonna put a lot of all my noises. All right, can you hear me? That's without the headset. Hmm. Okay, no, we're still we're still uh, experiencing the. Uh, I don't th I don't think it's on the end. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, we'll try and troubleshoot on our end. Okay, sorry about that. Let me put this back up. Okay, so uh, this particular case here um, is actually in Panama. Uh, I was on my way to the end and I found these trucks coming through with big, humongous mahogany trees. Uh, that to me was really shocking to see. 
but I know it's a, it's a sustainable industry in many countries, supposedly. Uh, but in the process of cutting these trees, they destroy a lot of other trees that are nearby. This particular shot uh, was in Panama, and it was interesting to find these two kids walking on the side of the road with what appeared to be a, a bird that they, try, they were trying to sell. So we stopped, and they actually offered this, the bird for sale. You know, we're really quick to judge when we go to other countries and we, th we see things like this and we don't, we don't know how to deal with. And um, in this particular case, obviously, well, what's going on was basically the, the guys have found this bird on the side of the road, probably hit by a car. Uh, they took it in and, um, and they were trying to sell it. So it wasn't, this is not a, any case of poaching or uh, illegal wildlife trade, but basically an incident, something that just happened and they were taking advantage of it. So the power of storytelling, I can tell you, I can go on this picture for hours because this is something that I started a project in Costa Rica uh, back in 2010. Uh, we were taking pictures of macaws and we met these kids that were on, the, uh, on this particular village in, uh, in Costa Rica. And um, we heard about them, one of the kids actually having a birthday party that day. So we decided to take the whole group, collect some money and go and bring them some really cool stuff for that birthday. They were so happy to see us come in and bring ice cream and all kinds of stuff for the kids. And we started a really nice relationship. And every year we go to Costa Rica, we actually bring food to the school where these kids go, or we bring them school supplies. So you can see actually, uh, there's a picture here on the right hand side, that's one school group that I took to uh, Costa Rica. And we collected all kinds of stuff and we brought them to these uh, kids in, uh, in this particular village of Tarcoles. And you can see a little girl all the way on the, uh, right in the middle between uh, the first one on the left, the next one, that's Melanie. And we have followed all their lives until now where she's about to uh, pretty much in a year she will graduate from high school. So this is what I call uh, storytelling. When you go to a place, believe it or not, this picture, these pictures that you see right now, these are basically uh, my breakfast. That was my breakfast one early morning in Ecuador. Um, believe it or not, they eat pork uh, as breakfast, uh, fried pork. And you can see the picture of the, the pig hanging on one side. This is all fresh, so we can eat it right away. The lady started cooking for me and I was able to uh, sample some of her food like 30 minutes later. It was unbelievable. Same here uh, in this particular case, uh, these are kids in Panama that they go to, uh, to school every day by boat. Everything is done by boat because they don't have any way to go by land. Everything is water and it's pretty impressive because the first time I saw this, I was basically, I saw these kids coming over towards the school and they probably have to paddle for about a mile, sometimes up to two miles. And I was like, oh my God, they're so young these kids by themselves, no, no life vests, no nothing. But they do this on a daily basis. But then the following day, we'll go cruising, looking for some frogs, and we found other kids just fishing like about three miles away. And uh, that makes me think, okay, how safe is this? And they live with this every day. But again, we put everything in contrast. And here in the States, Sometimes I feel like, you know, when my daughter was their age, I would not let her go outside sometimes. So a whole different place, a whole different culture, and things are so different. So anyway, tips for the traveling photographer. I can give you a bunch of stuff here, but I'd rather have you go later to my website or find out more of this. I'm going to lay down some of these as I show you some of the pictures, okay, as we go. But somebody asked in one of the questions that were sent to us, um, I, somebody asked me, so what camera should I, what kind of lens should I have, uh, get if I cannot afford an R, or I just have a, a really simple system or camera system, and I'm going to give you the answer right away. You don't need expensive equipment to get really good photography. To do really good work, you don't need the expensive uh, um, cameras. Uh, but if you follow some rules here that are listed here, you might be able to get a lot done with whatever you have. So obviously knowing your camera is the number one thing. A lot of people don't want to read their book and the manual that comes with that camera is it has everything that you need to know. Also do a little research before you go into any trip or you go shooting anything it can be wildlife, food, whatever. Do your research. Try to learn as much as you can about that subject before you actually start shooting. 
So I'm gonna go through pictures and I'll give you some of those hints, some of those tips that I have here as we go. Obviously when you travel, you like to bring back the landscapes. Landscapes are pretty much a way to say, hey, I was in this magnificent land. Obviously the landscape in Florida is completely different than the landscape in Galapagos and the same thing happened when you go to Puerto Rico or Mexico or Costa Rica. So bringing that landscape back, getting some really nice shots about what you see out there that is part of your job as a photographer. So try to use the light the best you can. Uh, I like to have the skies being as dynamic as they can be. This is actually Bryce Canyon. Um, and you can tell right here how the weather plays a big role in how good your shot is gonna look overall. So whenever possible, if you have the light is too contrasty, you can also use what is called HDR, that is high dynamic range. And that helps you out balance out the, the shadows and the highlights of your shot better. Obviously in fly motion, whenever you can, by slowing down the shutter speed, you can actually get that milky look of the water that send that sense of uh, serenity, but at the same time, you know that the water is moving fairly swift. Um, shoot against the light. Uh, there's no reason why you cannot shoot with the sun right in front of you. Uh, you need to be able to hide it in a way that it doesn't overpower your shot and becomes too contrasty. And again, using techniques like HDR, you can actually combine uh, two separate shots to create an image like this one. Shoot the landmarks. I mean, every time you travel to a really famous place, you wanna go by and take that picture because everybody knows, oh, the Panama Canal, yes. You won't believe how many people have spoke to that they say, oh yeah, I've been to Panama. I say, do you stop at the Panama Canal? And they say, no. I say, wow, pretty much if you go west into uh, Panama, you have to go through the Panama Canal. So <laughs> if you are there, you already spend the money to get there, you may as well stop. You know, it might cost you 10, $15 to go and see it, but it's one of those landmarks that, you know, it's well known. Same thing happens, you go to all these, uh, magnificent structures like the church uh, on the right hand side, that cathedral. I mean, you go there and you see it from the outside and it's great, but inside is even better for pictures. So make sure that you get yourself in there and there's many ways, most of these places stay open and they're open for visitors to come in and take pictures if they want. Now I follow rules of compositions, you know, that's, those are basic rules, like you divide your uh, your frame in three segments and where those intersecting lines are, that's where you want to put the weight of your composition. It doesn't matter if it's landscape, food, or even wildlife, you want to do that as much as you can. Uh, capture the lifestyle. When you're traveling, when you go abroad, you want to uh, bring a sense of what is to live on those countries. What do people do there for a living? So I try to capture those shots in between my wildlife shooting I take also a lot of pictures of people and what they do for a living. Obviously, when I saw this guy, this uh, I call this one Coconut Man. I found out that he goes all the way out down the river to uh, the shore, to the ocean, basically to collect coconuts and then goes back. And he does it two, three times a week. Uh, I was in shock because as you can see, his dog out canoe is almost non-existent, but he does it fairly often and he seems to be safe. Um, another thing that happens when you travel and you take a lot of photography, this is what I call street photography. This is a culture clash for me. When I take this kind of shot, um, I compare this to what I see here at home in the United States. And obviously I, I pick up little things here and there that are, uh, to me, will be like a big culture clash when I present this to somebody. And in this particular case, the sign up here, there's a sign that says, Pollos, Danny. I says, I'm going to translate exactly what it says there. Chickens recently killed. That means that there are fresh chickens. Uh, I don't think that you will ever hear that from Publix or Winn-Dixie. They will tell you they have fresh chicken, but they won't tell you that they just killed them in front of you. So this is how cultures are different and we have to accept the way that they live, the way that they do things and take some of that with us because to me, it's almost like a learning experience. Here's another good case. These are the Curayalas in Panama. They are indigenous uh, people that live on the eastern side of Panama. And what I like about this particular shot, when I saw it, I said, oh, I need to shot. It's because it shows the, the effects of modernization. Uh, the sign on the right-hand side 
is actually a cell phone company advertising. And the guy that was there, I was there just a minute before, was buying a SIM card. So even in these remote areas, people have access to cell phones. And I took a boat tour with one of them. I think the guy was on the cell phone half of the time talking to somebody uh, about some business that they were doing. So it's amazing that even in the most remote places, we are finding that people have cell phones and they're getting modernized. So here we go, food. Um, come on, if you travel, you're gonna have to eat. And at one point, you're gonna find that they don't serve the same things that you eat here at home. It's not like you can have a burger every place you go in Central and South America, but you can actually try their local food and uh, it makes a big difference. Um, the fact that you can try different styles of food, different seasonings, uh, you even try different meats. I mean, obviously you go to Ecuador and you can try something like guinea pig, you might, you might think, oh my God, how do they eat that? Well, we eat all the things here that are similar to that. I know people that eat squirrels in Florida. So every time I take somebody with me, I, I try to allow them to sample food and take pictures of that food in this particular case. These are uh, beetle grubs in the Amazon. As you can take the picture, you can see the picture is actually taken with really soft light. And it has a diagonal uh, type of composition. So it fills the frame from one end to the other in a diagonal fashion. Uh, sometimes we have to um, put together um, a little setup when we get something special like this one. We, we wanted to try shark and bake in Trinidad. So what we did, we bought it, we went right on the right, we were right at the beach, which is the best place to eat this. And we set up a quick um, table and make it look almost like a, like a commercial. Um, just to show the beauty of this particular dish. I, uh, I do a lot of work in markets. When I travel to other countries, I like to visit markets because they are full of colors. They uh, have, you get to see things that you will never see in your home country or in your town, wherever you live. Obviously there's situations that are really funny like this one. This is a fish market in Santa Cruz in the Galapagos Island and suddenly you're taking pictures of the ladies working with fish and you look down, there's a live sea lion down there moving around and looking for scraps from time to time. It's almost like a pet at this particular uh, place. Um, capture the light the way it is. Try to get a, do the best you can with the light that you have available. And this is a situation right here where I have a combination of different lights um, just to show how meats are sold in this market in, in Ecuador, it's, it's impressive because this is all cut early in the morning, it's all fresh and all that will be gone probably by noon time. Most of the food, most of this meat will have been sold, which makes it really interesting because it ha it's a whole different way uh, how other countries deal with food as opposed to how we deal with food here in the United States. Uh, shoot close and uh, uh, fire and close. With that, what I mean is that when you start shooting something, don't go straight with the camera in front of that person or whatever that subject is that you're shooting. Take your time to go little by little, gain a little, you know, uh, shorten the distance between you and your subject, but do it in a subtle way and eventually establish conversation with them uh, so that you can actually uh, gain more access to what they're doing and the type of pictures that you might want to do. Um, it happens more often than once that if you go straight with a camera to take pictures of somebody, especially in some of these countries, they, uh, they will just back out, uh, will not give you a smile anymore because they fear, you know, they, they get really shy about seeing somebody coming with a camera. So take your time, go slowly and you'll be able to get really awesome shots. Get close. Sometimes, you know, this is something that I tell my people, especially when we're doing macro work and working with small animals like this frog, try to get as close as you can. Feel that frame as much as you can. Shoot high and low angles. Um, I told you earlier that one of the things that I've been using a lot lately is a drone um, because it allows me to get to a, a place, a position that not many other photographers have been. Uh, so I carry this little drone and I get a lot of aerial shots and I'll show you in just a second how different that can be. But also when you're shooting on like uh, in the case of this church in Puerto Rico, I got really low to get a really nice perspective. So I'm really, really close to those steps 
just to create that um, upward type of perspective. And in the case of the old San Juan in Puerto Rico on the right hand side, same thing happened here. I wanted to include all the, the way that those, uh, those streets are made. Those are streets that were built back when the Spaniards were in Puerto Rico in, the, in San Juan. So here's a good example. This picture was taken eye level. There's a lot of trash going around. It wasn't a beautiful picture to me. It was like, it needs something else. So I pull out the drone and I say, let's go and see this from above because it might look completely different. Here's a shot from above. So obviously, yes, if I have the choice between this one and the shot before, I'd rather take this one. So at that height, at that altitude, you don't even get to see the garbage. Fortunately, it's bad that it's there, but at least I don't get to see it with this particular shot. Shoot through. I mean, sometimes you have to shoot through glass. You have to shoot from inside your car, looking at your rear view mirror, create an image on the rear view mirror. Shoot through in this case uh, is uh, some kind of leaf and the frog is right on the top. And we were able to set up the light in a way that it would show a really nice, almost translucent silhouette of the frog. Create a sense of uh, scale. Uh, you can see on the left hand side, that big dog out canoe is almost 50 feet long. And at the end is my daughter with one of our friends standing inside that huge dog out canoe. Um, the same thing with the, uh, the picture in the middle is actually the egg balam uh, in, um, in Mexico. And you can see how tiny those people are. And obviously as they get going up, they start walking up the stairs, it becomes even smaller and smaller. So that's a sense of scale. And so is this picture of my friend Mandy appears to be holding a termite, uh, termite mound, but in reality that termite mound is almost like six feet tall and is like 15 feet behind her. Capture color and ambience. Uh, this is really important, especially because we, we consume color. I mean, we love to see color. So anytime you see something that is colorful for you, it's gonna look better. That's why a lot of people don't really understand black and white which is a shame, but color seems to sell easier than black and white. So when you show color, people are gonna be more attracted to your photography. And that's perhaps why so many people oversaturate pictures sometimes uh, to the point that you know, they look unnatural. Uh, in this particular shot of the bar in downtown Panama, uh, the old Panama City, uh, these lights were all neon, so they were combined types of lights. So that's why you see so much richness in the colors is because of the variety of lights that were used inside that particular bar. And on the uh, right hand side, I wanted to create that ambience of this particular kitchen uh, in Costa Rica where everything is run by uh, wood. It's a wood stove that they're cooking in. So shoot colors and with colors, I mean, take details of things like this. These are fabrics uh, in, um, in Autobalo Market in Ecuador. Sometimes when you have too much sunlight hitting these type of materials, they shine too much. So you might be better off during a cloudy day or shooting when they are in shade because that way the colors are actually more accurate. Same here, early morning light. This is in Puerto Rico. Um, when we go out shooting, the best time for shooting anything, pretty much wildlife portrait landscapes is early in the morning late in the afternoon once you reach like 9 a.m 10 a.m the, the, the light is too harsh it gets too much and it actually kind of blow out the colors and they're not as vivid and saturated as earlier in the day so um photography for me is a it's, it's about learning that every subject has a story to tell meaning that um when I go to a place and I take a picture, sometimes I put myself in the place of that subject and figure out what is going on. What do you think that this, this person or this animal in this particular case, a sea lion, is thinking? You know, we're both looking at the sunset. It looked beautiful. And I said, you know what? This makes an amazing shot because I'm putting myself or I'm putting the animal at the same level that I am, wondering what is all this beauty that I'm, what, that I'm seeing and I wonder, am I gonna be able to see that tomorrow again? Every sunset is different. So you will not be able to get the same shot again, even if you try. So 
this is part of what you do as a photographer is try to convey that type of message in the way that you compose your pictures. Um, so I'm going to leave you here with some pictures uh, of wildlife that are some of the subjects that I shoot the most, obviously. I, uh, my passion is birds and reptiles and amphibians. That's what I shoot the most. Um, so obviously, I try to capture unusual things, like what's going on here, you know? It's just, um, this was something that I came across uh, about two years ago in one of my workshops in Costa Rica. Um, obviously, these two are two completely different species. So I think he was a little confused that day. I had too much to drink. Uh, but here's the right thing. This is what you should have seen. Right? I want to capture whatever is not the normal. Um, I like to uh, get birds in action, you know, uh, flying, uh, eating, that kind of stuff. So obviously, hummingbirds in flight are one of my passions. What about this guy? So actually, it's a little, little girl. It's a tiny little um, sloth, but because I'm really close to it, it, it looks like it's huge, but it's actually a baby still learning to move through the trees. And sometimes you find images that, you know, if you can put them together, this uh, has so much meaning to me from a biological standpoint, understanding why is that lizard doing on top of the marine iguana? Uh, there's a reason for that. So you have to take your chances and take the shots as soon as you can because it might only last a couple of seconds. So always be ready to take the picture whenever the opportunity arises. Oops, there you go. Uh, this particular shot also taken in Galapagos was, uh, to me, is really important from a biological standpoint too, because I watched this, uh, this uh, land iguana for about probably 20 minutes, and I kept her going from one flower to the next one. And even though she could eat the whole plant, she would only take the flowers, because she knows probably that if she comes back two, three days later, there will be another flower, but if she eats the plant, there's not much more she can eat. So um, it's kind of a really smart to understand how animals actually know what is the best thing for them and how they follow on a daily route eating the flowers that actually bloom every other day from these plants. Obviously, the closer you can get, uh, sometimes the better the image is because it kind of connects the viewer directly with the particular subject, in this case, uh, a green basilisk, and uh, you can almost look inside the eye of this uh, particular lizard from Central America. And at the end, uh, a journey is best measured by the friends that you make rather than the miles. And I can tell you that over the years, I have met so many good people. I hope some of them are actually watching this today because in a way, this is a dedication to all of you for being part of my trips over the years and to uh, join us on so many adventures in Galapagos with Holbrook and with me to other destinations. Um, you guys are the ones next to me when I'm making a lot of these shots. So many of these shots are shared. You guys have the same pictures. And you know what? It doesn't bother me because I think that's what we're all there for. We're all there to have a really good time, get those really beautiful shots that show the best of nature or people and landscapes and um, where they're all to share. And that's actually one of the questions that somebody asked uh, prior to the, to the webinar is that how does a, 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 a group changes the whole atmosphere and the environment when you are, well, usually I work with small groups and I try to uh, separate people as we go. Like we have different activities. We're shooting with one frog. We have one frog in one place. We move to another area. So we try, try to not put everybody in one place. Now from time to time, we have facilities, places that we go where we have a beautiful deck to uh, shoot birds that are coming to a feeder and everybody can spread out. You also teach them to be good uh, travelers. And when it's time to get tight and share the space, we learn to share the space. We all want that shot and we all uh, try to, uh, as much as we can, to give the opportunity. In my case, I walk back, I let people shoot and then I walk out and let other people come in. So I'm constantly making sure that the other people get their chance to take their pictures too. And with this, basically, I'm just finishing here. And if we have, we can move on. And 
answer some of the questions that people might have. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really interesting presentation, and uh, we appreciate everyone bearing with us on uh, your patience with some of the technical difficulties. But um, at this point, I'd like to actually bring in Sandy Schmidt. Uh, Sandy is one of our uh, she is one of our uh, group travel specialists, um, and she has worked with uh, Rainier on some of his trips. So um, if anyone has any questions about uh, any of our programs, Sandy is on deck to help. Uh, welcome, Sandy. How are you today? Good. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Good. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We're so excited. And uh, again, the technical difficulties, but Rainier, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so like I mentioned, we, uh, we are accepting questions. So if you do have any questions for Rainier today, you can submit them in the Q&A button um, through Zoom. Um, so I'll go ahead and start sharing a few of those with you now. And um, I will start with um, some of the technical questions because we've gotten quite a few of those. Um, so we've had a few questions about um, equipment and things like lens and flash. So um, one of the questions uh, has to do with digital point and shoot super zoom. Um, you had talked about lighting um, and making the most of available lighting. And uh, this person asks, how do I adjust the lighting for a very sunny day um, using a digital point and shoot super, super zoom? Their photos t tend to be washed out. So how can you compensate for that? Okay, pretty much every camera has some kind of exposure compensation, meaning that if you have a program mode and things are coming a little too overexposed, you can always go into dial in minus one, minus two stops and that will make your shot a little darker. So basically what it's doing is overriding the automatic exposure that you have on that particular camera. Uh, obviously we, we work with, depending on what kind of camera you work with, but obviously for the ones that are dealing with a higher end camera, professional DSLRs, we have many more options because of the way that those cameras actually perform. But the main thing is usually just change the exposure compensation and there's a button for pretty much every camera has one to overwrite whatever is exposure that the camera is trying to give you for that particular shot. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question, uh, if you had one lens to photograph wildlife uh, and specifically mostly birds with, what would it be and why? And someone else asked, what is your favorite <laughs> lens? So I'm gonna lump those two oh, together. I'm gonna show you one. <laughs> oh, hey. For those of you that are shooting wildlife, um, this is uh, probably one of the most affordable lenses right now in the market. We're talking about less than a thousand dollars you can get a 600 millimeter lens you can actually buy a sigma uh, 150 to 600 it's a beautiful lens that does pretty much everything that you need i have bigger lenses than there, than this and now i've been using this mainly as my main uh, lens to go to for wildlife photography especially for birds just because it's really easy to carry i can take it anywhere i can take it to galapagos it doesn't occupy that much space and like I mentioned earlier on my presentation, if it breaks, I can buy another one. And the quality is fairly decent for the type of uh, lens that you have here. So somebody asked me exactly that also about what kind of lens will I use for wildlife? I would prefer to use a zoom lens because of the flexibility of changing the focal length. I can go and I can crop in or zoom out at any time without having to back out. You know, if I was using my fixed 400 millimeter lens or 504, I have to move the whole rig back. But with a zoom lens, you get a lot more flexibility. So this might be probably the best way to go if you're shooting wildlife. But with that said, if you are starting and you don't have the budget, I mean, the basic lens will be uh, 75 to 300. This is how I started. And uh, I tell you, I have really awesome pictures taken with this one. I actually won an award at a magazine uh, um, a long time ago. And it was actually taken with a 75 to 300. So uh, how good you are as a photographer is not dictated by the kind of gear that you have. Uh, I worked with a group from a National Geographic one time in a project and I learned about one guy in Peru that worked for National Geographic shooting with a, back then we were shooting film, he was shooting with a uh, Pentax K1000, really basic all manual camera and the guy was shooting for National Geographic so reality don't get frustrated because you don't have the greatest and the latest when it comes to equipment because you don't really don't need it if you're doing the right thing. Great thank you. 
Um, let's see, another question about uh, equipment. Um, someone's asking, what's your opinion about micro 4.3 cameras, like the Olympus mirrorless cameras for wildlife okay. photography? They're actually magnificent, especially for wildlife photography, because that crop factor, I mean, it makes things look a lot closer. You don't have to invest on a, on a really long focal length to get really close to wildlife. Uh, in terms of quality, they do impressively great. So I, I, I don't have any objection. In fact, a lot, of a lot of manufacturers are moving more towards the mirrorless type of camera. So I would not be surprised that this continues to be a platform for many of them in terms of design. Uh, but they're even doing micro, uh, I mean, uh, uh, micro for territory, they're doing uh, uh, mirrorless cameras now with full sensors. So you have all the quality that you can get on a really nice compact type of camera like this one. You have interchangeable lenses and you can pretty much put anything you want on them. So it's, it's impressive. Great. Uh, what are your guidelines for using a better beamer on your flash for wildlife? And can you comment on depth of field when making a picture of still wildlife? Okay, yes. Uh, better beamer. I tell you that when shooting wildlife, I, I use a flash a lot. The reason why is because you need to do some field lights. And the best way to do it is with field flash to uh, basically fill in the shadows, create a really nice catch light on the eyes on the, on the animals that you're shooting. Obviously, you do this with a lot of care. I care much more about the wildlife than I care about taking the picture. So I'm really concerned that if I'm going to do something that is going to disrupt that particular wildlife that I'm shooting, I'd rather not take the picture. Uh, I know that there's really strict rules in many places, including Galapagos, about the use of flash because of the same reason. Sometimes it's a little exaggerated, but I'm not going to go into that fight. I'm a biologist, so <laughs> I work with animals on a daily basis, and trust me, if they were going to die because I'm flashing them once in a while, it would be a big deal, so that's not the case. Um, in terms of setting for the flash for the better beamer, I set it up uh, on the zoom on the flash head. I move it to 50 millimeters, so that gives me the best coverage. And usually, you know, you don't need a, a, a better beamer if you are shooting within 20 feet of your subject. Now, if it's farther back, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet, then I would recommend that you use a better beamer to actually fill in more, uh, more light. And at the same time, the better beamer helps you to uh, speed up the recycling process of the flash because it's not, it's not needing to uh, release all the power from the capacitors. So therefore you can shoot many more shots with really quick stroke type of effect and get more pictures, especially when there's action in between the subjects that you're taking the pictures of. Great. Uh, a couple questions about tripods. Uh, one person would, would like to know, do you use different size tripods? And another person is asking, is there another option besides a tripod for shooting under low light or fast shutter conditions? Yes, there are, there are many, many options for uh, basically substituting a tripod. I use a tripod. Um, I will use it fairly often. Um, sometimes, you know, especially for macro work, because you're working with tiny little subjects and any motion will actually render your focus, the, your focal plane a little off. So we do most of the composition using a tripod. Uh, but in terms of uh, substituting the tripod, yes, you can use a monopod, which is just basically instead of three legs, you have only one. It helps you level up, you know, kind of have a better uh, support for your camera, um, which is uh, something that you might do, especially if you're traveling and you're going on a tour and you're going to walk in a city and you want to get a, a nice, nice shot of the cityscape and you don't have a tripod but you're carrying that one it's a lot easier uh but you know you can always find different ways to brace your camera with a block with a tree with anything you know you have to be really creative on how you you manage uh the conditions in which you are shooting and what you can do for to stabilize your camera okay um, we have some questions about techniques for shooting specific subjects. So um, I'll share two of those. One of them is asking, um, can you share some tips for photographing water drops on flowers? And then another question uh, is, how do you catch hummers on the fly? And I've seen your, your hummingbird photos, so I can understand uh, why they ask to take some great photos. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to give you a hint. For all those people that I have, because you might have so many questions that we might not be able to address them all. They can always go to my website, wildstockphotos.com, and in the contact section, send me an email. I get back with you. I have instructionals that are free. You can go to my website and download on how to do high-speed photography for hummingbirds. There's 
a full instruction out there. The way that we do it is by using multiple flashes and low intensity, uh, low power intensity, so that the, uh, uh, the actual flash uh, light happens at a really high speed. And that's what we freeze, that's how we freeze the action. Um, but you can go to my website and find out more or send me an email. I'll be more than happy to answer any question. This is free of charge. I'm not selling you anything. I might want you to come on one of my tours one day, one of my trips, but that, that's up to you. Uh, so I will be able to answer questions later on to my website day one. Great. Um, just switching gears here a little yep. bit. Um, one person asks, how do you manage your photos each day when you're on a group trip? And so I guess kind of the question is, do you edit them at the end of each day? Do you wait until the end of the trip? Uh, well, to I'm going to tell you, I can also send you uh, on Facebook. We have for every trip that we do, we have a Facebook page that is live the moment that we arrive to our destination. So yeah, I do a little bit of editing here and there when the time permits, because I'm a busy guy when we're on tours. I mean, we wake up. I know the people that are there watching that have been on my tours, you know that I like to wake up early in the morning. I have you running early. Sometimes we skip lunch, we go shoot and come back. I mean, we skip uh, breakfast at the time that we were supposed to. We go and shoot and come back and have breakfast later. So I like to maximize the time when we are on a place like, say, Galapagos, Costa Rica. So basically um, what we do is that we, we set up to go to a particular destination to shoot early in the morning and then come back, have breakfast, and go back to uh, shooting. So, because that, what was the question exactly? Can you repeat uh, the question? Sure, it was how do you manage photos when you're on photos, a trip? Yeah. Trip? Okay, so going back to that, yeah, that's where I lost track of what I was saying because <laughs> I was trying to tell you that, that I sometimes I don't have that much time, but because I keep people aware of what we're doing on a daily basis, people that are here in the States, I go and I edit pictures from time to time. The same thing participants will go and take their best shots of the day and then go boom and post them on the, on the Facebook page for that particular trip. So what I do every night, I back up all my cards and I do a dual backup. One goes into a, a hard drive, separate hard drive from my laptop. That way I have backups on both places in case of something were to happen. Then when they come back home, we have several race systems where they all get stored. Then when I get the time, I go and I clean up and I make what I call, you know, my signature shots, the ones that I like the most. And I tell you that for me on average, going out on a trip to Galapagos and spending a whole week, I probably come back with 10 images that I like. Doesn't mean that the other ones are not great. It's just that these are the ones that really show the Galapagos the way that I want it to show. So those are the ones that I kind of separate and those are what I call a signature shot. But I can have tons of sea lion pictures. They might not be as striking as the one that I select. Sure. Okay. Um, before we wrap up, I guess uh, we'll finish up with one last question. Sure. And um, we have people who would like to know um, if you can talk a little bit about some of the places that you've visited and do you have a favorite place to photograph? Favorite place to photograph? Wow. <laughs> ah, destination, destinations. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? There's not a favorite place. It's really hard to tell because to me saying, okay, Galapagos is better than Costa Rica, or Costa Rica is better than the Southwest United States would be, would be totally false. Each one of these places have their beauty and you have to be there at the right time to be able to capture the best of those places. So, but if I had to, if you really turn, my, you know, twist my arm, uh, I would say that I like tropical areas. I like the rainforest just because they're teeming with life. You know, it's one of those places where you really see how important those trees are and how, how much uh, interconnection are happening there between trees, like uh, flowers, uh, hummingbirds, bees, insects, uh, reptiles. So I think that that is the place where everything comes together. In fact, most of the life as we know it nowadays in terms of bird life, the birds that we know here in the United States, they all started in the tropics, so right at the equator, and they spread it all north and south from there. So obviously those tropical areas are still the, the best places for me in terms of subjects. Great, thank you. Um, wonderful. Well, yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. I will just briefly mention, um, and you had mentioned this as well, that we do, uh, you have a trip coming up in March of 2021 to the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, and yes. there is still room available on that trip if anyone is interested in joining, correct? Okay. And that is uh, March 5th to the 14th of 2021. 
Um, and so uh, we do have the link here on the web page and, um, or excuse me, on the slide, and we'll be sending out an email as well with a link to that as well uh, in case anyone is interested. And um, uh, Sandy, I don't know if you could maybe talk just briefly um, about how Holbrook works with photographers in terms of customizing trips or, or some of the ways that we work with photographers uh, to make sure that a trip is appropriate for photography specifically. Okay, sure. Absolutely. We want to get the photographers in the place where they need to be at the right time. And I think that's very important. Um, so we work with our field um, partners and make that happen. Um, we provide as much customizing as they need. And I think that can be important too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I add something? Sure, absolutely. Add something? <laughs> yes, I, I tell you, you're the only company that I use to, to put my trips together, especially to Galapagos. It's been a, always a pleasure because, like I mentioned to uh, one of you earlier, talking about how we do things with Holbrook, uh, the fact that I'm able to customize some of the trips based on what I think is the best for my clients. Uh, so we want to make sure that we go to a particular destination when we stop in, in Quito. Uh, I can tell, hey, uh, Sandy, can you look up if we can go to see Antisana or Juan Goloche to shoot the hummingbird? So there's a lot of flexibility, and that's what I like about traveling with the, with the whole group team. That's good to hear. <laughs> yes, thank you, Renee. Great, thank you. Well, can, I'm answering questions here in the meantime. There's a bunch of them. <laughs> Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll just wrap it up by uh, letting everybody know that we do have another webinar scheduled for next Wednesday. Um, we'll be doing a webinar on eBird, Understanding eBird, uh, the world's largest citizen science program. So if you're new to eBird or interested in maybe giving it a try, uh, we'll be talking, uh, going into some detail on that and uh, exploring that topic a little bit. So we hope you can join us. We will be sending out a, an invitation to that uh, shortly. So. Uh, we hope you can join us. And with that, I will say thank you, Rainier. Um, we really appreciated your presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. Sorry about the sound. I, it, we didn't have any of that <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we appreciate everyone's patience. And, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.